All right, we are now recording. Okay, great. So before we get to the uh, regularly scheduled agenda, um, Russ, I've asked Russ to just give us a very brief update on what's going on with the proposed rules and when the final rules will be published. Uh, but he's guessed really, but I thought Russ could, could shed some light on that for us. It's, not, it's something that we're all kind of keeping on. Well, great. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and thank you, everyone, uh, for this. I could make it real short saying we, we're not sure what we don't know at this point, but I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that a, a little bit. Uh, we had expected the final rule for the accreditation and state authorization uh, federal rules to be out by the uh, end of end of October or end of September, I should say. Um, being that it's September 24th, that's not going to happen. Uh, so we're, we're expecting it in the middle of the, uh, probably the early, more likely middle of, of October for that to, to come out. And the reason we say that it won't come out this week is that I know that, uh, uh, unless Cheryl's seen anything different today, that she's been watching uh, the OMB reports because the, if they're going to publish it, they have to send it over to the Office of Management and Budget to look at it before they publish it. And we haven't seen that step uh, happen yet and that usually takes a good week after uh, after that but what we're waiting for for the state authorization is that remember that to solve the uh, uh, complaint issue for one thing that they were going to do an early implementation of those rules uh, at least around that in terms of uh, so that there wouldn't be the requirement for a uh, a complaint process in each state and that they would do that what else they might do in early implementation is a question um, we don't know for sure. Um, they may they may just keep it right to that one issue, and then um, anything that gets uh, so all the other issues that are not part of early implementation uh, would come out now. There would be the final rules, but those would not go into effect until July of next year. And so that's where we're at. Uh, I know that um, uh, Dan and Cheryl have a 43 part series describing this, that they have ready to go once it comes out. Uh, well, maybe not that long, uh, but they, they're, they've been working on it, you know, anticipating what will come and we'll, uh, we'll certainly keep you up to date on that. Uh, Cheryl, do you have anything to add? Uh, just that, I, I did notice that um, if they are combining this, we could see that come out relatively soon. I did note on OMB that the accreditation issues are listed as final regs, final review is what it says. Um, so I'm not sure what they're lumping together. They were separate with a different RIN number, um, but whether they've merged it, I don't know. Um, so it, it is still a, a large question mark. Um, so since I have to be on the road for another project this weekend, Murphy's Law is that it'll come out. But, you know, uh, Russ has a vacation coming up soon. So, you know, Murphy's Law is that it could come out then. You know, we have all of these different conditioning things that uh, could cause these to come out. But what's interesting, I think, is having looked at the borrower defense rules and seeing what the department did and that the HEA um, indicates that the secretary's um, discretion to make certain regulations um, become effective or provide that flexibility for the institution to choose to follow um, a certain uh, regulation early um, before the, um, the ultimate effective date, which is what we saw with Borrower Defense for July 1, and there were a handful that were permitted for the institutions to determine to follow them, uh, more, uh, follow them um, earlier rather than July 1. And as Cheryl said, since they like putting these out late on a Friday before a three-day weekend with uh, Columbus slash Indigenous Peoples Day coming up in, uh, uh, in D.C. and uh, many eastern states uh, in, in a few weeks, we're covered, that's kind of the current betting at this point. Well, before we, before we, we close this, Cheryl, you, you mentioned a couple of things quickly, and I'm put a little bit more on. What, what, what is the significance of the OMB review? How does that fit into the process, just for the basics? And what is an RIN number? Well, that's a good question. And Russ may able, be able to indicate the RIN number, um, what that acronym uh, stands for. And I apologize for not knowing that off the top of my head. But for OMB, they're, they're looking at the financial um, impact um, 
for um, for the regulations to before they go out. So it has to go through that process um, so that they can make those determinations before they can be released. Russ, do you have an indicator of what the RIN uh, officially stands for other than an identification number? Yeah, I'm not sure what the words actually stand for, but it's just how they track uh, right. with, within the office on, on this. So. I'll go with regulatory um, <laughs> um, in, indication number or something like that. Identification. identification. Yeah, there you go. Something like that. But I, I yeah, so it, it is, a, it's a marker. Um, and so they're each given that each of these issues are given one and uh, accreditation issues was separate from state authorization going back prior to um, rulemaking starting. So, you know, this RIN number for state authorization, you know, goes back to when um, they were released and delayed, you know, in the first go round. So, um, so I don't know exactly how that um, what that means moving forward in terms of having this big package being provided um, through those proposed regs that came out last June. Yeah, you're right. They may com combine those in this accreditation one. So we'll see. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks to you both. I, in this uh, cultural era right now of remakes, maybe maybe Schoolhouse Rock needs to remake <laughs> and add on a few new things like RINs and OMB reviews. Uh, there you go. Um, so speaking of enjoy, enjoyable presentations, let's move over to Mary Ann Boki um, to tell us about the State Authorization Guide. Mary Ann, are you, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I was really excited when Dan asked me to come on today and talk a little bit about the State Authorization Guide because it's something that's been in the works for a while now, and so it's, it's my pleasure to say that we finally have all the pieces in place and it's up. So what is the State Authorization Guide? Basically, the goal was to provide a public resource of basic information for institutional and program compliance for out-of-state higher education activities. Uh, most of you will recognize these surveys. They look a whole lot like the SHEO state surveys that really guided us for so many years um, in the compliance area of state authorization. The SHEO surveys were kept up for many years, um, particularly from Shamila Mann, Dr. Mann, over in that office. But it became uh, difficult for that office to keep those up. They did not have a budget stream for that. Um, and it was a little bit outside of what they, they normally do in terms of, of their work. So WCET and NC Sarah and SHEO got together and decided, wouldn't it be a great idea to keep these updated, to keep them um, available for public use uh, and, to, and to give them a home. And so about 18 months ago, we all got together and decided to do just that. And we are excited to say that we do have that new website. It launched in August of 2019. Uh, along with our new NC Sarah website, we now have the State Authorization Guide tab at the top of the website. And I believe if you click on this, it, it hyperlinks you straight to that page. And my guess is most of you have probably already um, uh, rummaged around uh, over in there, but it's a great public resource. We will be keeping it up to date. Um, WCT SAN has done a lot of great work with us on this. They are contributed to this project. A special shout out to Dan, because he did a lot of behind the scenes work. Besides going through the SHEO surveys and organizing them and thinking through them and paring them down a little bit, because we're in a little bit different place today than we were 10 or 11 years ago, we then had to input all the data that was coming in from these states. And Dan took on a bulk of that work. So thank you, Dan. Um, a few things have changed in these surveys, and you might have noticed that if, you, if you've gone in there and looked at them. Like I said earlier, we did pare it down a little bit. So instead of nine pages of questions, I think, I think we got it down to six. We're very proud of that. Uh, but most notably, I think you'll see that on the first page of that survey is all the contact information and not just the agency information, but we tried in many cases to have one, if not two people from the agency listed. And then we go on to have um, quite a number of website links because so many of the uh, state authorization agencies now 
have put together beautiful websites that really have organized the information so well, much more user friendly than they used to be. So we list those up front so folks can navigate where they need to go. Also, you might have noticed that we've added a question. Question number 12, how to retrieve transcripts from closed colleges. This we decided to do for the benefit of students. We really wanted to reach out and help students uh, untangle this thorny problem because so many students don't know where to go for that. Um, and we were lucky enough to be able to ask that question and get almost all of the surveys responses to have um, information in there about how to go about this. Um, Shio also has been kind of answering phone calls and emails and sending them to the website if they get those questions. But even, believe it or not, the federal government, um, some of the folks over there have been, have been alerted to the fact that we have this information on the website and they're sending students there too. So I'm really pleased that so many folks are getting good use out of that one. I also am pleased to say that we only have about 10 states that have not responded to the surveys. That is phenomenally good. And even those 10 states, we're working on them. Uh, not only do I have the SHEO folks kind of poking them a little bit, but the regional compact um, SARA directors have also jumped in and are nudging gently on those states to see if we can get those in the fold. So what's next steps for these SHEO surveys are now what I'm calling the state authorization guide or even the guide for short. Uh, what's gonna happen next is we are gonna send out a survey to all the regulators in late fall. And we're gonna ask them a few simple questions such as how does this survey work? Are you finding it helpful? Are there questions we should have asked that didn't? Are there assumptions we're making that maybe we shouldn't make? Because it came to our attention here at NC Sarah that we have never actually asked the state regulators their opinion about this, these surveys, and it's high time we did that. So this fall, we'll be sending that out. We'll collect all of those responses, and my guess is we'll probably hmm, massage a little bit of the survey and send it re out to everyone in early 2020. And at that point, I think we're gonna be in a really good place where we can get in a kind of in a in a system of updating it, you know, once or twice a year officially and then unofficially from the states themselves as things change. So that's kind of where we are with um, the state authorization guide. Why don't I pause and see if we've got some questions or some thoughts or comments about the work that we're doing here. And Dan, do you see any questions? I don't actually see them on my screen. <laughs> yeah, there is one question um, so far. Uh, are there plans to add professional licensure disclosure requirements by state, either as a component of this guide or as a separate project? Oh, that's a great question. And yes, it would be a separate project because it's a little bit different, but we certainly will be doing that and probably sooner rather than later. The idea is that we would have con contact information um, for the professional licensures in the various states and the various disciplines, and we would have that all up on, on as a public resource up on our website. So yes, great question. Oh, and good. Someone I think just put the link to it. Thank you. I thought it might be hyperlinked in the agenda, and I think it, I think it is. It is. But uh, Cheryl, thank you. I think you just put the actual link in there. Uh, for those um, of you looking at the NC Sarah web pages, it's actually at the very top and it just says the state authorization guide. And if you click on that, it'll take you right to it. So Marianne, mm -hmm. one question is, um, what, what would you say are the kind of best uses for this? What, you know, what, how, how do you anticipate um, sand coordinators or others best using the site? Oh, great question, great question. So there's a couple ways that you might wanna use this site, I think. Um, the first is if you're not a member of SARA or participating SARA institution, this of course is just a wonderful wealth of information on how to stay compliant in all the states. But there's a few other ways that you might wanna use this. If you are a SARA institution, 
there are still instances where you might trigger state authorization in a state and you might need to be looking at those a little bit more closely. So this gives you that first step. You know, by no means is this the end all information on compliance for these states, but it gets you in the door. This is a great resource where you can go, get some information, find some web links, get a little bit of information so that you can really put together a thoughtful question or query to the state that you're interested in getting more information about uh, authorization. So again, useful for non-SARA and for SARA institutions in that way. But I think there's some other things that we're looking at for this survey down the road. Uh, and that is similar to that question number 10, or question number 12 rather, about the transcripts from closed colleges. So that's very useful for students. But as we, we look to the future, I can see us thinking about some other questions that we might want to get our heads around uh, in terms of compliance. So we might want to be looking at tuition recovery, surety bonds, that kind of thing in a little bit more depth than we do currently. But really we're going to wait to see first what those regulators say they find useful or what they might like to have added to the survey. So I think having this conversation um, again in January, once we get all those responses back would be so helpful. Um, because then we'll have a little bit more to go on at that point. Um, Mary, I don't Anne, know can I add a, a little bit into uh, some of the things that, that we were sharing here um, in terms of some of the questions too, uh, just so that our SAN members are aware. Um, yes, it is very easily accessible from the NC SARA website and from the SAN website, both on the homepage of each of those websites, you can reach the guide quickly. And also, uh, I appreciate Mary Ann bringing up about professional licensure. Uh, we are working on uh, some sort of, uh, on, a, on a project, but I think what people need to be aware of is that this, has, this is going to have to do with contact information, not analysis of what um, is required from professional licensure boards. In a similar manner, somebody asked about Secretary of State. That is another challenging area, which is why we have uh, provided contact information for Secretary of State information from the SAN website for SAN members, because the analysis and the assessment of each institution is going to be different. And we heard that loud and clear from the Secretary of State's offices and then pro provided a narrative about how to get your arms around that subject. But I think what we're trying to do is, is SAN um, and also with our colleagues at NC Sarah is working with um, folks to be able to have um, access to start research. The research is still going to have to be done by institutions um, for the particular issues at the institution, but we want to give you direction of where to find information and um, how to um, do the research, which is what we'll continue to do. And, and as far as um, somebody was asking about, um, and I appreciate Mary jumping in to, to share the answer um, very much, uh, is about being able to know state um, requirements because we do have a number of members in SAN that are not participating in SARA. Either their institution has opted not to or they're in a state that does not or a territory that is not participating um, in SARA yet. So we are providing that variety of information um, you know, through this tool and um, you'll find that this resource is going to be beneficial, um, as Mary Ann pointed out, if you're doing an activity that is outside of um, SARA um, policy. Thanks for letting me jump in. Absolutely, that was excellent. <laughs> um, Mary Ann, have you been able to see, there's a, there were a couple other questions uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, there was a question about, are, are there plans to address Secretary of State was one of them. Right, and we do, we do thanks, to, thanks to Sam and to you, Dan, uh, we do in fact have Secretary of State information listed on there as well, but, but Cheryl's absolutely right. It's just the contact information. Right, right, okay. Um, and then there was another one here. Would it be reason? Sorry, I, know, I normally can see the chat questions, but for some reason my computer is, it's minimizing everything, and so I can't read it all. But oh, that's all right, that's all right. Nice. I am um, reading aloud is one of my, one of my skills. Uh, <laughs> Would it be reasonable to link to the guide's complaint process from an institutional website instead of listing out those links individually at a school site? Not sure. 
totally understand that question. Hmm, I don't sure. I'm not sure I quite get that one either. Um, I think what they're what they're referring to is the former list as we've kept on the SAN website. Um, people will remember back in the dark ages, back in <laughs> by dog years, like 2012 ish. <laughs> the um, there was a dear colleague letter that indicated that um, to be compliant with 668.43b, that people could link to an outside third party. Um, but but indicated that the institution had to be um, had to know that the link was um, was still working and that the information so it really put it back on the institution um, to check the work um, and I don't know if that's applicable um, anymore because that was uh, 2012 and that was referring specifically to the SHEO surveys right. um, so this is not so this has not been readdressed since I, that time. I, Cheryl, I think you, you hit it right on the head, is that that was, that was a while back and it was specific to the SHEO list, which is, this is not. So um, I think that that probably won't happen. Okay, great. Um, but good question. Yeah. Does anybody else um, have any other questions related to the guide? Okay, seeing none, um, we will move on to um, some in-house business here with the SAN Advisory Group update from Lisa Siefker. Lisa, take it away. All right, I believe I am unmuted. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you for asking me to provide an update on behalf of the SAN Advisory Group. Um, I'm planning just to talk briefly about what the group worked on over the last year and then what we might be working on uh, over the next year. So as far as an update on the last year, the advisory group met virtually around each quarter as well as meeting in person at the NASAPS conference uh, in Florida last spring. And a good portion of our conversations over the last year focused on what the role of the advisory group should be. So since this group uh, was just created last year, and we didn't really have a precedent to look at as far as setting an agenda or goals. We had some initial planning and organizational conversations to identify what those goals might look like and some ways that we could accomplish them. So we had kind of a blank slate going into this to set group priorities, uh, which was kind of a challenge, but also a really good opportunity to talk with the other advisory group members and learn from each other, um, which was very interesting from, since we're all from a variety of different institutions. Uh, one initiative that came out of those conversations was the creation of special interest teams, which is another new initiative that members are probably familiar with. Um, and the idea behind those teams was to provide an opportunity for SAN members to actively participate in sharing information and doing some research and developing resources that the other SAN members could learn from and use. So the advisory group talked through how special interest teams might work, um, how we could identify members to participate in those groups, um, and at that time, we identified two topics that we knew would be of interest to our members. The first topic, which uh, just came up on this call, was around professional licensure research and disclosures, um, which, as we all know, is one of the most challenging areas of state authorization compliance with new federal regulations coming and SARA requirements that are a little bit different than those regulations. We were looking for a way to provide some resources for members uh, that could assist in developing some processes there. So one group is working on the professional licensure issues and the other special interest team is working on data privacy issues, um, which as we all know is another area impacted by a lot of changing regulations right now. 
So we have a special interest team doing some research in that area also. So the advisory group is participating in the special interest teams and kind of guiding the work that's being done on those issues. Um, let's see, in addition to special interest team work, um, the advisory group has also been assisting Dan and Cheryl in development of the CN member survey, which went out to members over the summer. Um, after that survey was complete, we kind of talked through how those survey results could inform future CN projects and resources. Um, and aside from those projects, the group gave feedback on the statement of work for CN. Um, we provided feedback on the, the compliance management certificate, which is another um, new initiative. Um, we also gave feedback on the special election that was just held to fill an open position on the advisory group, um, which Leanne Fields was just elected as the new CN advisory group member. Leanne is the executive director um, of educational compliance at UNLV. So we're looking forward to having Leanne's perspective um, on this group going forward also. So that sums up the, the main projects that the advisory group worked on over the last year. And as far as going forward, um, we'll be continuing work on some of those projects that I just mentioned, such as the special interest teams. Um, we'll continue to share ideas and feedback from an institutional perspective with Dan and Cheryl as they're planning CN resources and content. Um, and other than that, we are very open to any ideas from CN members as far as um, what projects the advisory group uh, should be working on or some resources that you would like to see in development. Um, we are definitely open to those ideas, and if you'd like to email them or chat with us, um, we would really appreciate having ideas and perspectives from other members, too, in this work. Um, so I think that sums up what we've been working on. Um, so Lisa, that, that's a, that was... Um, um, that leads me to a question I had. That was a great summary. Because um, one of the uh, purposes of the SAN advisory group is to be, you know, kind of a representative group for the, for the membership as a whole. My sense is that um, there hasn't been a whole lot of communication from members towards the SAN advisory group members. Is that, does that sound about right to you, Lisa? Um, I haven't personally received a lot of that. Yeah. Um, I think since maybe it's a new group, um, maybe that would be a reason for that. Um, but definitely that's something that we would welcome going forward. Okay, that's great. That's great. And I think it's good to just just good just to reiterate that. Um, and, um, to, to try to implement that in the future. So, or encouraging the, the other members in the in the future to uh, seek out these fine representatives uh, who were who who you elected. Um, another question I have, Lisa, is what would you say is the kind of um, most? Um, how would you like to see the group improve for the next year? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, in the next year, I think since we now have gotten to know the other group members a little bit more and we kind of have some projects started and a direction that we're going, I think in the next year we could just um, put more of that into action and move from the planning phase more into implementation of some of those ideas. So speaking of implementation, we did see one question. I don't know if you saw it in the chat, which was, um, when do you expect to have the reports uh, slash resources available in these areas? Um, I'm guessing that is referring to the special interest teamwork. Um, I, think so. I think so, yeah. 
I have been involved in the professional licensure special interest team, so I could speak to some of the projects that we're working on in that group. Um, and we expect to wrap up um, work on a blog post, um, as well as kind of a checklist that you could use to complete prof professional licensure research um, in the next couple of months, I would say. Okay, that's great. And then there's another question here. Um, what would be a specific situation where one would reach out to the SAN advisory group versus all SAN colleagues? Um, there's no, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Anybody else can um, as well. I think um, there's no, there's no bright line test for that. You, you should always be, be, um, happy, be willing to to reach out to the, to the whole network. I was thinking of the SAN advisory group as more the people that you say, hey, this is a direction that we want SAN to go in. This is, we really love to see SAN develop a new initiative such as, you know, uh, a kite, kite throw, uh, building seminar, whatever whatever the case may be, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about the, um, the advisor group is kind of the pulse of the members, but of course, any connections among any of you is fine, and you can, of course, always come um, to me or to Cheryl. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, or does anybody, Lisa, or I see, looks like Terrence is on, Tyson is on, I'm not sure if Catherine, does anybody else want to chime in on that? That's, that really is a great question. Right, I, I would echo what Dan said. Um, if, if it's a question more about a resource that SAN might be able to develop, maybe the advisory group would be the right audience for that question. And I think of kind of the listserv questions as you're looking for examples of how another institution handles something that you have a question about. And, and we are hoping too that um, the new mix, the new software that we're using for our reserve and other member interactions, maybe that will generate more communication on all of these matters. And um, we're learning about that tool as it goes along. Um, but that might also lead to more robust discussions about any of this. I mean, it's just a reiteration that you know, we, we are a membership organization and we take we take that seriously. So we want to be responsive to members. <laughs> Dan? Yeah, yeah. Terrence. Yeah. How are you doing? I would like to just add uh, one more piece to that. Uh, early on, as Cheryl indicated back in the, uh, I guess the dark ages, if you will, there was a lot of confusion about what state authorization was and those that were working in the trenches were asking for assistance on how to articulate and communicate what state authorization is to senior administration on their respective campuses. And SAN helped put together blogs, uh, webinars, and things of that nature, various resources to help uh, compliance officers on campuses uh, articulate exactly what their work was and how the institution needed to get on board, if you will. So, you know, as, as Lisa just indicated, SAN serves as a resource to its members. So in the event that a member feels, okay, I think this is something that I need assistance on, reach out to the other members. If that doesn't yield the necessary uh, results that they're looking for, reach out to the advisory group and say, can you all come up with something or create something that will assist us as we do this work? So again, just providing a resource and, and to, to its members on how to go about to do the work of state authorization. Yeah, that's great. And, and the other thing too is the way Cheryl and I have, have, have leaned on this group is, is, is kind of for just that we say, hey, Hey, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're up at the, at the membership level, but what's happening at the institutions, 
and we we will float an idea by by them as as again as your representatives and say how how would this sound how would this work um, so the more they know uh, the more the, the more it helps us so um, unless there's anything else on this uh, see in the in the chat there that Leanne has put an update on one of the special interest teams work, which is great. Um, we would like to shift now. Um, Shan, um, Cheryl, you're up to talk about the annual meeting. Great. Um, before I get to the annual meeting, though, I am going to add just one more thing about um, some of our uh, membership interaction. And um, I was glad that Dan brought up WCET mix. Those of you that are also WCET members know that um, WCET moved over about a year ago to the new software um, for the email distribution and we just did it in the last couple weeks. And so um, what's new about this uh, software, as Dan indicated, we are still exploring what we can do, but we know we can build communities even within what we already have. So we're trying to see how that works. But in the meantime, I think that one of the most useful things that you all will be able to do is be able to research um, certain issues because there are from time to time people will ask a question and I'll go I know that we just asked that question a couple months ago um, so maybe you would be able to look back because we're going to be adding keywords you know that so that there will be some sort of keyword that will be able to indicate that will show you where to go back and be able to find some of the questions that were asked previously whether it be professional licensure um, or, you know, we often have folks ask us about um, members' experiences with international compliance. So if we are able to tag it as international compliance, you could go back and look and see, you know, if anybody has been able to share uh, information on that previously. So I'm really excited about that aspect. It's a much more viable research tool than it was under the other listserv uh, software that we used so this will be um, easier to use um, so I, I had sent an email out to everybody I hope you save that email so you can learn how to go into the tool and, and play around in there um, to determine what kind of access you have and we'll keep building that out as we become more comfortable um, with the tool as well so I'm looking forward to that and I hope you will reach out to us and reach out to the um, advisory group with the thoughts that you have um, for us to, um, you know, keep making what we do relevant and helping with your work. So that being said, uh, we have the WCET annual meeting and uh, with that comes the face-to-face -face, uh, SAN coordinator meeting, which I'm very excited about. I'm excited every year we have, um, we have a, a a large number coming. Um, we have already 70 registered to attend. And uh, what the SAN, if you're not familiar with the face-to-face -face meeting, it is at WCET the first day, or actually the day before the WCET me meeting actually starts. We do a one-day meeting from 10 to 4, where we will um, learn of the state of the state authorization network. I can, I'll provide an overview of the previous year. We are uh, excited about being able to share um, the Sensational Awards and uh, we will have some relevant presentations to the work that we're doing, but it's an all day event. Um, we go 10 to four and then at five o'clock we'll meet in the lobby to walk about a block and a half to the Appaloosa Grill um, which is where we'll host, host the um, sand gathering, which is like a heavy hors d'oeuvre um, gathering um, that's about a block and a half away from the Hilton where we're staying. And so everybody's really enjoyed that in previous years. So that's how the WCET annual meeting will get started for us as sand members. Um, I noticed from the, the list of those attending that the majority plan to attend the full WCET annual meeting. You don't have to. So we have a number of folks that are coming in just for the San Quarter meeting, and that's great. I'm glad you're going to be with us. Um, but some are going to stay for the entire WCET annual meeting. And those that are staying, I can assure you that it is uh, quite a robust uh, list of sessions and um, and opportunities that will be made that'll be made available to you at the um, conference. And so you can go on the WCET site and the preliminary agenda is already there. 
and you can see who our presenters are and what the sessions are and it's a very diverse group um, I'm very pleased that um, you will notice also some I'm going to highlight a couple things our friends from NC Sarah uh, we're thanks to Mary Ann she's putting together a session on data and how um, how the Sarah data reporting, it can be a benefit for your institution as well as what we do with data. So um, that will be a very good session. Dan will be uh, working with Mary Ann on that as well as um, I believe an institution member and uh, um, Terry Taylor Strout who helps them uh, with their data. So that will be, um, that's a session you won't wanna miss. And we also will have a special guest, Diane Auer Jones, will be doing a general session on the Wednesday morning. Um, she'll be introduced by our friend um, Michael Goldstein from Cooley. And so we're really looking forward to hearing from her. She's undersecretary for the Department of Education. So wide, wide ranging sessions, learn something new. That's my biggest takeaway to you all as you're planning is um, learn something new while you're at the at the WCET annual meeting. A lot of these issues are are touch upon what we do, and the more we're well versed in what our institutions do, the better understanding that that we can have with them about what compliance is going to look like and how it affects all of us at the institution. So um, I encourage you to um, look at the at the listing before you go because you can find that on the WCET website. And if you have any questions about it, don't hesitate to be in touch with Dan and I in advance. But we look forward to seeing you on that Monday um, from 10 to 4 and then to go to the sand gathering. Any questions about the annual meeting? Well, if you do have any questions, something comes to mind, don't hesitate to be in touch and uh, we'll see you there. And um, I think it'll be I think it'll be great. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Um, so, there, uh, Cheryl, Cheryl gave a great summary of the annual meeting. The only other announcement to mention coming up here, two more, is the open forum coming up down below on October 9th. A little professional development will be talking about um, career paths. What do you do after you've been doing authorization compliance for a while? Where do you, where do you go? Then we will talk, then the other thing to remember is we are podcasting these days. So I hope you've had a chance to listen through to um, the first the first few and um, we have some good ones coming up. So thank you for that. Um, let's see, we do have a couple questions here I see in the chat. Um, okay, do we have an agenda for the advanced topics workshop next week? Cheryl, we do, I believe, would you want- Okay, would, sure, would I'll, I'll handle those. those, those are fine. Yes, we do. Um, I have, I have a, an email prepared to go out to you all. There were some last minute changes with some of the people that will be attending. It was, I intended for it to go out this morning, um, but our, uh, we had a couple of people who last minute could not attend. And so um, we have new people that are, are being added to that list. And I wanted to make sure that was finalized before I sent it out, but you will get an tentative agenda um, when the email goes out before close of business today. Um, then I see about open forums. Open forums are not recorded. It is meant to be an informal discussion. And so it, it's intentional that we do not record open forums. We record these SAN coordinator calls and we obviously record a podcast. Um, and we also transcribe the, the podcast and this recording. So you can find all of that on the SAN website. The podcasts are available there. Um, in our in our resources there's a tab that indicates past events and podcasts so you can find um find those uh there are the sessions at wcet recorded the san coordinator meeting will not be recorded i do not know about any specific sometimes we have specific sessions at wcet recorded i don't know if this time we have any of that planned russ can you address that um, about whether anything at WCET will be recorded this year? Uh, I haven't, I'm not aware of our putting anything out this year, no. Yeah, that's been a, um, a sometimes thing depending on what, what there is. Um, but you can find, uh, and, and the SAN coordinator call will not be, um, the SAN coordinator meeting will not be provided. 
um, a recording. Uh, yes, and the podcasts are there. I encourage you to go to the home page of the SAN website. That is going to have up-to-date information. You can reach a number of things, including the open forum link and this, uh, it, it's provided right there and what the topic will be. The podcasts are there. Um, it, the news items are there. The links that support the news items are there. Um, plus, as I said, quick links like the NC Sarah site, the guide, um, and a number of other resources that you may want to have quick access to. You can find those links on the homepage of the SAN website in a very prominent location. I don't see any other questions. Well, Dan, I'm going to switch back to you. Mm. Yep, Cheryl Urban, you're right. I think that's a typo. Rats. October 8th uh, is the open forum, not the 9th. The 9th is a Wednesday. It's always the second Tuesday of the month. Um, okay. Um, on that, on that note, um, we look forward to seeing you all uh, soon and um, have a great rest of your Tuesday. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody, and thank you to our presenters today. <laughs>